The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Any rare animal is difficult to study, especially species that are nocturnal and not easy to find. He's out. He's back out. After Harvey, once I was able to get out, that's when I started heading towards Rockport. I write about water environment because without a healthy environment, we don't have fish. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. We're about uh, three or four miles from Oklahoma in Wichita County, Texas. Look at this one over here, Silas. Well, it doesn't come out vertically. You want to set a trap? Yeah. A trap and a camera. I'm a graduate student at Texas State University in the Wildlife Ecology Program. And we are surveying for Texas kangaroo rats. They hop on their back legs like a kangaroo, hence the name. It looks a lot like your pet store gerbil, about again and a half as big, with a white tail tip. It is a state-threatened species. So it does seem to be pretty rare geographically. It's only been found in 11 counties in Texas, and within the past 20 years, only found in five of those 11 counties. They're about the handsomest rodent that you can find. If we lose it here, it is done as a species. It would be an easy species to pay a little bit of attention to and keep on the map. Got anything over there? There's two or three. Today we're surveying to see if kangaroo rats are using the same burrows and areas as they were this summer. There's quite a bit of burrows over here. Fresh kick out. Let's us know that it's active and not abandoned. We're setting motion sensitive cameras that will record video um, in infrared. And we're also setting spring loaded box traps. I'm going to bait the area. Are we seeing just the last vestiges of populations that are hanging on? We don't know. Uh, I think. That's the reason uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service want to find that out. Right at the next intersection, there should be a burrow. Well, we are assisting Texas State University on Texas kangaroo rat research. And uh, in addition, we're actually funding them through our state wildlife grant program. It's a species that's not federally endangered yet, but it's a species of concern for us. It's, it's obviously declining. We don't have a lot of great information on this species, so we're trying to learn as much as we can. But it's a species that we're concerned about, and it's been a concern for a while. I haven't seen one yet. I've seen some other species of kangaroo rat, but not the Texas kangaroo rat, so I'm, rocky for them. I'm hoping to. More times than not, we'll get them on the camera and not in the traps. They're rather trap shy. Right, we're giving up. Fingers crossed for some rat activity. Any rare animal is difficult to study, especially species like this that are they're nocturnal and they're elusive, and they're not easy to find. Roadside surveys have been kind of a survey method of choice. 1,500 survey miles total, so that's driving around at night uh, between 10 p.m. and about 5 a.m. The success is always low. You've got to cover a lot of miles to find a very few individuals. It gets a little bit tedious, and some nights we went without seeing a single one. Went home uh, a little upset.
He's back out. He's like groundhogging us. Up, up, down. Been dark about an uh, hour and a half, two hours, and I already got some activity. Cotton rat. Well, we only saw one. Uh, two kangaroo rats. <laughs> Pretty quick. Weighs a few hairs off to get a DNA sample. Sorry, buddy. Then we're gonna weigh him 93 grams, and then we're gonna get some standard length measurements on him. 42 millimeters for hind foot, ears, eight, and tail. Right at 210. All over tail. All right. We would like to find enough of these animals to say that, okay, here's a species that may have been in decline. If we learn enough about it, we can, instead of putting it on the endangered species list, implement some management strategies. It's one of our prime objectives at Texas Parks and Wildlife. Hey, hey, hey. Keep things off the endangered species list. 80 grams. The bag's 10 grams. Oh, yeah. oh. Another uh, Texas kangaroo rat. Nice. If they exist in these roadside habitats, they may be evolutionarily adapted to fire and bison herds, those disturbed environments that would occur after those events. They hop, adapted to wide open spaces, bare ground created by some agricultural practices, by grazing, may be very suitable for these animals. Short grass, well grazed, lots of areas between grass so they can move around freely. Edges of farm fields where you have the little bit of bare ground next to the fence, and that seems to be their ticket. They are unique. It's part of this ecosystem that's been here for a long, long time. Why not care for it? They don't have any detrimental effect to the landowners. They don't invade houses don't dig large holes, they don't disrupt farming practices, so they can exist here very easily. There's more interest in non-game species than there has been in the past. We really need to have more natural history information on the whole gamut of wildlife. We know really very little. This is great information. 181. We're learning more about the habitat needs of the species, its biology, its life history. It's very valuable as we try to develop recommendations for private landowners. So this guy is ready for release. Any key to the future of this species is going to be through private land. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program. I usually average about 5,000 miles a month. My last truck had 298,000 miles on it, and this one I've had four months, and it's got 21,000 miles on it. I could be in Tyler one day and have to be in Brownsville the next day. I don't mind the driving. I actually enjoy seeing the parts of Texas that I see. Ron is really uh, what I'd call just a model employee. There's a problem that needs fixing, he's gonna work on getting it fixed. He really does set the bar for how you deliver customer service. The most common stuff that I do is repair telephones or try to figure out why a computer's not working. But just because I'm a phone guy doesn't mean that that's all I do. After Harvey, once I was able to get out, that's when I started heading towards Rockport. I went down to Rockport to do an assessment to see what was destroyed. Rockport Region 6 State Parks, their building was uninhabitable. I was able to do some wiring and get them telephones and computers working in that temporary building so that they can continue to do their job while their permanent building is being remodeled. From the time we got dial tone back from the local carrier, I had them working in a 
temporary building within 24 hours. He plays a very critical role in that emergency response team because he sort of boots on the ground in places where a lot of people aren't being deployed yet. One of my proudest moments of being with Parks and Wildlife was I went down to get my brother-in-law's mother out of her house and on the way back I passed probably 10 Parks and Wildlife trucks with boats attached to them headed right to where I was running from. That makes me proud of Parks and Wildlife. I'm proud to drive around with that symbol on my truck. I have a a saying that a guy taught to me a long time ago, my first real job out of high school, and it was up to it and down to it, damn a man that won't do it. If a man won't do it, he ought to be tied to it and made do it. If he can't do it, lead me to it and I'll do it, and that's all there is to it. You know, I was lucky I grew up in a family that loved to fish. The memories I have is of me and my brother fishing in farm ponds in East Texas. It's just always been a part of my life. This is the same country my great, great, great grandfather saw. I'm looking at the same water, catching the same fish that he caught. I write about issues related to fisheries, water, the environment, because without Without a healthy environment, we don't have fish. And so when people don't care about something, they don't feel any connection to it. If they don't know about this place, they don't know what's at stake, they don't care that they've lost it. That's really been my goal, is to let folks know what's going on out there. They talk about the, the recipe for journalism or the formula being who, what, when, where, and why. Well, Shannon is absolutely solid on the who, what, when, and where for sure, but it's the why that really sets him apart. He is so interested in the resource. Shannon is one of us. He, he goes out and he does it. He goes out and he hunts and he fishes and he enjoys the resource. And because of that, that keeps him in touch with his readership. He brings those stories every week to literally millions of readers who are able to read through his articles what's going on on our lakes and rivers and streams and bays and estuaries. He's an ecologist, he's a conservationist, and he cares about everything beyond just what we typically think about on the surface. His intent is to cover the story but as a conservationist and somebody that believes in the freshwater streams and rivers and lakes of Texas, he's a huge advocate. Second Commissioner Warren, all in favor? Aye. Hearing no opposition, the motion carries. And I thank you, sir, very thank much. You. We appreciate you express your views on behalf of CCA, which brings us to- He is so involved, he goes to commission meetings. He carries those things that affect the anglers. I probably attended in this job 50, 51 commission meetings. And I bet I can count on one hand the number of meetings that Shannon has missed. He's an active listener, and Shannon takes the time to learn those issues from A to Z. That's the way you learn. That's the way you find out what the issues are. That's where you meet both sides of, of issues in a lot of cases. You can't cover issues unless you understand them. You can't just parachute in. The thing that is just almost an oxymoron is he is so humble. Well, I promise you, he doesn't think he deserves this award, and I'll be one of the first ones to tell you that he absolutely deserves this award. And his humility is part of what makes him such an outstanding writer. He brings a very thoughtful, objective voice of fish and wildlife management or conservation and outdoor recreation in Texas, and Shannon Tompkins is there to tell that story. I'm not going to write about, the, you know, the difference between braid and monofilament or how to tie a different knot or which baits are best. There are a lot of people who cover that a whole lot more than me. If they read something I write that, that makes them remember a feeling, if it makes them wish they were fishing, I want them to care. I guess I, guess I just want them to care as much as I did.
Texas has the highest diversity of bats of any state. And so anybody who loves wildlife should try to make time or, or find the opportunity to see these bats emerge. It's, it's always really fun. In the face of this terrible disease, there's suddenly a lot of attention going to bats. Bats have been maligned for thousands of years. Most people don't have any contact with bats, so what they know about them is what they've seen on TV. And most of the time on TV, especially if it's Hollywood, they're blood-sucking monsters. Animal bats, the kind that fly? People think all bats have rabies, and they don't. It says some of them bats is rabbit. They're not carriers. If a bat gets sick with rabies, it dies. Well, and that ain't all. People think bats are blind. None of our species of bats are blind. It was full of what looked like huge bats. Besides using echolocation to navigate and hunt for their food, they're also using their eyesight, so bats aren't blind. A lot of people think bats will get in their hair. So we dispel that myth. I think a lot of people are, are afraid of bats because they don't know much about them. And like most things, the more you learn about them, the more interesting they become, the less scary they become, and quickly we begin to realize that bats are actually quite beneficial to humans. Texas is really special for bats. We have the largest congregations of bats in the entire world. People travel all over the world to see Bracken Bat Cave, Old Tunnel State Park, Congress Street Bridge. It's a wildlife phenomenon in Texas. The majority of bats uh, wake up as we're going to bed and they'll go eat insects. And they eat huge, huge, huge numbers of insects. There's actually a long history of people working with bats and benefiting from bats. From March to October, bats are gonna eat tons of bugs. Uh, those are primary agricultural pests in the area, so you got cotton bull moth, the corn earworm moth, uh, army cutworm. Because of that, farmers, one, don't have crop damage, two, don't have to spray a lot of pesticides on their crops to kill those bugs. If you like bananas or chocolate or tequila, you can think of bat. So this is where we're at, or at the entrance here. Uh, here in North America, we got 47 different species of bats. And here in Texas, we have 33 different species. In these caves, they're all hibernating bats. We've got like uh, four species that we generally encounter. Cave myotis the tricolored bat, the big brown bat, and Townsend's big-eared bat. They all generally like these cold, stable caves. Uh, it makes it easy for them to hibernate, and uh, each one of them has unique requirements. Cave environments are extremely sensitive. They are tied in with underground aquifers and water systems. They oftentimes have endemic species or species that are only found in that one spot. And cave systems have very few nutrients. There's very little input of, of nutrients coming into those systems. Okay. We've been counting the number of bats within each of these caves, identifying the species, and collecting swab samples to contribute to this greater national white-nose surveillance effort. White-nose syndrome. White-nose syndrome. What is this white-nose syndrome? It's called white-nose syndrome. White-nose syndrome. The deadly white-nose syndrome. Uh, white-nose syndrome is a devastating disease. Uh, it is a new disease first detected in the winter of 2006-2007. And I can even remember those first random emails going through the bat community chain pictures of these bats with this fungus on their nose. Does anybody know what this fungus is? Nobody knew because it was brand new. It's caused by a cold-loving fungus, Pseudogymnoastis destructans, or PD. That fungus is not native here to America. Our North American bats have no adaptations to respond to it, and consequently it's devastating them. Bats that are susceptible to white nose tend to share a, a common trait in that they all hibernate. Hibernation for a bat, there's a very narrow budget of energy that they're trying to make last for many months. So the way that white nose hurts them is by 
irritating their skin while they're hibernating. And just the process of waking up, cleaning off your, your wings and, and fidgeting around a little bit burns off critical energy and the result is starvation. We've lost at least 5.7 million bats, probably more. The fungus or the disease is now found in 30 U.S. states and five Canadian provinces. And we see devastating population declines uh, wherever it goes. Some bats are very severely impacted by it and we see almost total population collapse. It has since spread kind of out from that spot down the southeastern part of the country and worked its way towards Texas at about a rate of 200 miles per year. Based on predictive models for how the disease was going to spread, it appeared that it was going to be funneled through the panhandle of Texas into the western states. We had clear battle lines drawn. We knew which direction the enemy was advancing. All of a sudden, to have it show up in Washington state, now it's coming from behind us as well. It's definitely not encouraging, and it is actually quite alarming. The challenge of treating white nose syndrome is much more complicated than just treating the disease. We can't just think about curing the bat of the disease. We also have to be aware of potential impacts to the cave ecosystem. If we sprayed a fungicide or some major disruptive chemical into a cave, we just don't know how that might impact the system. So the plan in Texas is to take advantage of this window of opportunity we have now to learn as much as we can about bats before the disease gets here and be prepared if an opportunity to apply some kind of treatment arises. And, and, and luckily we have a lot of smart researchers working on, on solving that problem, but I think we still have a long ways to go. Nature is so incredibly complex that the more we look, the more we learn with pretty much any species. Each species of bat is unique, fills a specific niche, and we have so much to learn from them. The loss of any one of these species is a real tragedy. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.